Let's press the enter key, make sure it is recording first. Then we'll do something that's pointless. Mm. From Microsoft HoloLens VR development kit, new phones, continuum, and so on. So it sounds like you know, Microsoft is actually on its track to be more innovative again, you know, as opposed to uh, the, uh, the Balmer days, <laughs> for the lack of a better word. Okay, so they are supposed to be making a HoloLens development kit with uh, this. Okay, so we'll put the link here. Of course, this is the Microsoft website. So the HoloLens is the fully untethered holographic computer, enabling high-definition holograms to integrate with your to your with your world, unlock all new ways to connect, create, collaborate, and explore. So this is, you know, I think they're they're, they're leapfrogging uh, Google Glasses because Google Glasses is just one side, you know, on a projection device you know, with a projection device, and this is stereo you know, vision. So you know, I I think it's kind of cool. Uh, it will be kind of cool to integrate this with uh, Kinect, you know, the 3D you know, perception thing. So if you if they can mini miniaturize you know Kinect and put it onto the headset, then the computer can see the entire world in 3D and combined with the, the, the capability to project you know, 3D images, that would be kind of cool. Because now you know, the computer can actually superimpose information and whatnot on top of objects that you're actually seeing. So that's, uh, you know, so I really think this is exciting. I mean, this really helps to push the envelope to the next uh, level. So it's AR? Hmm? It's augmented reality. Yeah, it's AR, and you know, I guess if you, they might have an option to cover the entire lens. Then it's VR, right? You know, it's easy to turn uh, AR into VR by you know not letting you know actual light coming through. <laughs> you can years. imagine you know this can be integrated into a GPS, like for navigation. So when you turn your head, instead of having to look down or you know, look somewhere else on the GPS, you know display. You know, now the turn can be projected on the road itself, and you see a little arrow, you know, saying, okay, the next turn is over here. So you never really have to look into the GPS and go, like, how far am I away from the left turn, right? Then your eye will be here, will be looking down to the GPS screen, and not, you know, actually you're focusing on, you know, on driving, you know, on the road. Or a 3D um, road. Sorry? Or a 3D road in the sky. Yep. So you know, if they do it right, you know, there there's really a lot of potential. Okay, and I think uh, this opens up, you know, the a new a whole new area of app development, because it's still going to be app development, but it's not, you know, what you already know about app development on, you know, the boring devices like these. Okay, <clears throat> the big question is how are they going to click with a, you know, three uh, D thing. I know it's not assembly language programming, but I'll let you guys think about this a little bit. How do you click when you are going to use a device like that? Would How you use voice command? Voice command may work, but you know, voice command does not have precision. Yep, go ahead. It tracks the eyes movement. Yep, they can track the eye movement. Yep. But you can't do that when you're driving especially a stick shift. Because when I'm cornering, my two hands and my left foot will be on the paddle, my right foot will be on two paddles. So I can't really you know, do any type of uh, hand gesture at the time. I'll tell you one post potential, potential solution, okay? So what they can do is they can project a clickable thing, you know, on the 3D display, but it will at a different depth from what you normally would be seeing. So it can be closer, it can be further away, okay, depending on you know, what you're actually interested in. So by moving your eye to focus on the near object, that can be counted as a click. But then, you know, this device needs to be able to track your eye movement because, you know, when you look at closer objects, your eye goes like this. When you look at further, uh, far objects, your guy, eyes go like this. So they can use that as a, as a mechanism to say, okay, I want to select this. I want to select that. 
I guess blinking can work too, but that's kind of dangerous because we naturally blink. So if you so happen to blink in the at the same interval, like tick tick like that, you know, naturally, and the computer thinks you're clicking, that may not be a, a good option. So this is kind of interesting. You know, they will have to. Do, do something about the user interface so it's not really just projecting something, but you can also use it as an input device. How many years until we have neural linking? So we just take I don't know. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> I'll be the first one to line up and say, yeah, I, I'm ready for beta testing or even alpha. Give me my nanites. All right. So anyway, this is a slash dot. How many people know slash dot already? It's like, ah, oh, yeah, I check it every hour. So, no, you guys don't know about flash slash dot. The the name slash dot is interesting because the guy who came up with this name was trying to confuse people because when you spell out the URL to this website, what is it? It's http colon slash 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 dot dot org, right? <laughs> so the question is, which part is the word slash, which part is the word dot as opposed to the symbol of slash and dot? So that's why they named the website you know, slash dot is because you know, they, it's intentionally confusing when you spell out the URL. And I can imagine the Federation of the Blind may have an issue with this because it is not accessible according to the ADA. <laughs> I'm not going to go there too much. So. All right, so what we'll do today is a lot of fun stuff, okay? Last time we talked about floating point uh, numbers. So what we'll do today is kind of like a two, there are two things we're going to do today. So I'll give you your homework assignment first for the next, uh, for the next <coughs> month, Tuesday. Um, and then we'll continue to talk about floating point numbers. So we're going to, oh, wrong class, wrong class. Take this class, there we go. Okay, <clears throat> so I did manage to finish up um, the skeleton of a new processor. So I will display that first and explain, you know, just in words, you know, the components, and then I'll describe your homework assignment. Um, I made a subsection here. Um, it is, oh, I should have uh, indented this one too, so just hold on one second. Let me indent that one too. All right, so this is all good. So there are like four <coughs> things here. Uh, the first one is who's driving, who is driving which bus. That's what we talked about before the floating point discussion. So you kind of get an idea of, you know, remember on the, on the whiteboard, I drew some diagrams with lots of wires going everywhere, okay? So that's kind of the, that particular discussion. You can still read it. If you have not read it, you should probably be reading first. But the focus is gonna be on the second, link here, which is your know, text processor V2, V2 for version 2. I thought about you know, calling this your know, text processor reloaded, but then it's not very scalable because the next version is going to be reloaded, reloaded. So you know, version 2 is a little bit more scalable. So we'll go ahead and um, save link as and put it into my temp folder. Okay. Was it like from a phone or was it actual singing? Yeah, actual singing. Actual singing. Okay. You guys want to write up a score and just run out and say <laughs> 10, negative 5, 2, <laughs> pi. <laughs> or better yet, I. <laughs> what is I? Imaginary. Imaginary, yes. And what do you call numbers that have the I component? Imaginary number. Complex. Yep. Complex. <laughs> Complex, yes. You can also, um, you also, you can also hang, you know, uh, put pi on that number. What is pi? Or E, your pi, your, all those numbers are called what? Irrational. Irrational, exactly. So you can say, Okay, I, I'll give you this score, pi. What does that mean? It means it's irrational. <laughs> All right. All right. So this is this is the new processor, which is which is better than the old one. You can still download the old one and compare to this one. But this is a, this is slightly better because you know I think I cleaned up the design quite a bit. 
Um, so it's easy to work with, and it is also in many ways more flexible. Um, but the diagram is cleaner. You can see there are not <coughs> as many connections as the first version of my processor. You can do the, you can do the comparison later. All right, so when we look at everything, you know, all the inputs or most, well, all the inputs are specified. Some of the outputs are left unspecified. That's okay, because we're gonna make, we're gonna make changes to the design, okay? So there'll be some homework assignments to uh, improve and also enhance this particular design. Um, I just want to point <coughs> out a very important components. So on one side here, we have the memory module. Okay, this is just a piece of RAM, you know, that's coming from uh, memory in the category. We already know how to deal with RAM. Okay, there's the address bus, the data bus, uh, the chip select. Okay, you know, are you talking to me? The clock line. Okay, the, the transition of the clock will you know, write content into RAM. Load LD, which is basically controlling. Are we specifying a read operation, or are we specifying a write operation? And clear, clear is basically just a reset line. So when that line is asserted, uh, all the content in this particular RAM module will be you know, cleared to zeros, okay? So those are the interface you know, to a RAM module. That's not really the main focus of this you know, particular design. So I'm gonna scroll a little bit like this because this is the processor. And all the lines going to the right-hand side that are now truncated because I did not show the RAM. That's how the processor interfaces with RAM, okay? I was not able to find a tool to draw a boundary box you know, for the processor, but this is close enough, you know, I think it's gonna be okay. Are there any questions about, you know, which part is the processor and which part is quote unquote outside of the processor? Okay. So the RAM module is the only part that is outside of the processor. The reset line is kind of outside of the processor too, and also the clock. So these two are global lines, they go everywhere, okay? So I would just direct your attention to these two lines. If I click on one, no, it does not show, show attributes, no, okay. I, I was hoping that it would show you the, uh, how this, this line is connected to everything else. Does anyone know whether there's a way to do that? Some tools allow you to do that. If you select a particular line, it will highlight you know, all the connections, but it, apparently this tool does not have that ability. I think if you click on the simulation mode, and yeah. then you click on that line, it will highlight okay. all of them. Okay, so let's go to simulation mode. Oh, there we go, thank you. So you have to, it has to go to simulation mode first, which doesn't make sense because in the design phase, you know, sometimes you want to be able to see that too. So right now you can see the clock line goes into the clock of everything, okay? It goes into the clock of the register bank, okay, which is labeled registers right here. It goes into the clock line of the address register. It goes into the clock line of the PC or the program counter. It goes into the instruction register, the clock line. It also goes into the clock line of RAM. In other words, there's only one clock of the entire, in the entire system. And the clock line eventually will hook up to a clock signal, which means it will toggle automatically. But for the homework assignments, you know, this is just a pin so that you actually get to click and change the state of the clock line because that's, <coughs> the, that's how you're gonna debug your design, okay? Because you have to go clock by clock. The reset line is the same, it goes everywhere. So if you, clock, if you click on the reset line, it goes into the register bank, it goes to every single register that we have in this particular design, because when the reset line is asserted, I want everything to be reset to zero. All the registers, all the RAM content, everything will be zeroed when I assert the uh, reset line. Are there any questions about these two particular signals? Okay. Then we have you know, the specific control signals into each particular module. We'll start with something that's simple. We'll start with the instruction register. The instruction, the purpose of the instruction register is to store the opcode, which is a binary bit pattern, to be decoded so that we can execute the instruction, okay? We don't have a microcode engine yet, okay? So the one big part that is missing right now is the music box. So we'll deal with the music box later, okay? But before we deal with, before we deal with the uh, music box, 
we have the instruction register, which is going to store the instruction or the opcode that we are going to execute. Okay, where do we get the instructions? According to the Bonneman design, okay, where do we get instructions to execute? Memory. Okay, so that's why when you look at the instruction register, the INSREG, the input into it is coming from th these lines here. This is the entire uh, data bus, okay? So the data bus connects to memory on the right-hand side, but it also connects to all of these components. So we can use the address, we can use the data bus to directly uh, go into the ALU, it can go into the address register, it can go into the instruction register, let me just point out where I'm talking about. Okay, so it comes out of one of the output registers of the register bank, it goes into one of the inputs of the ALU. It goes into the multiplexer that eventually will feed into the program counter. It goes into the input of the address register. It also goes into the input of the instruction register. So this is one of the bus, or this is one of the lines where it has a lot of connections. Okay, So, so potentially we can have problems because there are multiple components here that can drive the data bus. Okay, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> if you look at, um, okay, this is the part, because the register output, register zero output can drive the data bus. Which other component can drive the data bus here? The other three are inputs, but there's one component that is out, the, out of the screen right now that can drive the data bus. Which one is it? RAM. RAM, exactly, okay? So with several components that can drive the data bus at the same time, how do we resolve a bus fight? Each component uh, that can drive the data bus, there's a, at least one way to make it shut up, right? If you look at the register bank, how do I turn off the register bank so it's not going to drive the data bus? Register, register zero output enable. That's correct. Okay. So that's one way to you know make it you know shut up you know and say okay don't drive the um, data bus and you can also see the only way to get into a register right now okay to get some content into the register is through the ALU so I might decide to change this later but this part is not important to your homework assignment okay so I'll explain that later um, if you look at the address bus. Okay, the address bus is this one here. The address bus is quite the opposite, okay? Everything that can potentially drive the data address bus has to go through this multiplexer. So what we want to do is to figure out, okay, but so what is the input into the multiplexer? One thing that can come, that can be used to uh, drive the uh, address bus is register one output. Um, another one, which is this one here, is the address register, which kind of makes sense because it's, it is the regi address register and its purpose is to drive the address bus. And then the last one comes out of the PC, the program counter. This is you know, the third component that can drive the address bus. This line is left unspecified because I don't have another, I don't have a fourth component that can drive the address bus at this point, so it is left unconnected. Okay, it's okay to leave this one unconnected because it's going into a multiplexer. As long as I don't specify that input to connect to the output, things will still be okay. Yes. Did you leave it? Did you leave an open input for future, or could yeah, you have just that's that's the reason why. For a multiplexer, it's okay to leave it unspecified because you know if you if you specify the select pins correctly, it's not going to be using it. So are there any questions about the general design of this thing? Well, we have certain, and we have all the enables, you know, not, uh, I haven't talked about the enables yet. So this enable just enable the input into the address register. Uh, this enable enables the program counter input so that, you know, when the enable is a one and you have a rising clock transition, then it will take whatever is in the D port and change the content of the register. That's the behavior of a, of, of a register in general. Okay, and then we have, you know, register in enable, okay, you know, are we ready to change the content of 
the in, of one of the registers. This is the input port. Um, the two output enables, one for the first output out of the register bank and one for the other output out of the register bank. So these will control, are we ready to output something out of the register bank? And you can select which register is which, which register as well. Are we still doing okay so far with this design? Your homework assignment is actually quite easy, okay? Your homework assignment will focus only on this part here. Okay, so when I let me just kind of magnify so I can show you exactly which part you are going to fo be focusing on. So your focus is going to be right here. Um, it will all be you know, within the PC, the program counter, and the instruction register, and the two lines that you have to specify to the RAM module. So that's basically what you have to do. So at this point, I'm going to go to the homework assignment and take a quick look at what you are supposed to do. All right, so this is your homework assignment. The fetch cycle of a processor would use the program counter, the PC, to specify a location in memory. That would be the location where the opcode is located. The content of that location is then stored in the instruction register. The instruction register is abbreviated as INSREG in the diagram. After this, the program, uh, the program counter auto increment, so PC will auto increment because you are, you'll be ready to read the next opcode, okay? So it has to be ready for the next one after you read the current opcode into the instruction register. The PC should, should also auto-increment so it will be ready for the next instruction. In this assignment, download my, you know, version two processor design, which is, you know, in the other window right now, and start with doing the above operation by hand. So what you want to do is to switch to this one here and go into simulation mode and just, you know, try to figure out how, what you need to click, what you need to specify in order to do what we're supposed to do, okay? Now, you might want to do this because the content of RAM is all zeros. It's pretty hard to design, to, to debug the design because the register starts with a content of zero and all of these RAM locations also start with, you know, zeros. So what you might want to do is to change the content in memory so you have some actual non-zero values. Now what you specify here is not important because nothing is really decoding these instructions. So you can just specify a whole bunch of nonsense you know, values, okay? Anything that's non-zero is gonna be okay. And then you wanna say, okay, but how do I get that two, three, okay, into the instruction register? How do I auto increment the PC? So if I were to repeat the process, I'll be reading one, two, next, and then I'll be reading FE, and then I'll be reading D0, okay? But you want to do everything by hand first. You might want to keep a log on the side or rely on LogiSim to keep a log for you, okay? Because you know, keeping a log of all these clicking can be kind of troublesome. So what one thing you can do is when you're in simulation mode, you can go to um, the, one of the options here, go to logging. And then you can select what you will be what you'll be logging. There's a lot of stuff going on here. You don't need to log every single one of these. So what you want to log would be the clock line can be useful because you will be toggling it, you know, from zero to one and back to zero. The instruction register, okay, so you can uh, you can do a shift click to select multiple items. So the uh, in register instruction register enable is going to be important. The program counter, program counter enable, program counter input selection, um, let's see, RAM load, RAM select, you know, those would be useful too. And then control click can let you select something that's not in the block. So if you control click the one that you do not need, it will just leave it out. Um, let's see, I think that's it, okay? So these are the signals that you definitely want to be able to log as you do your experiment, okay? Let me show you what happens when you do a log, okay? So all of these are now you know, being logged. And if you go to table, it's it's gibberish, okay? At this point, it's just gibberish. You can also go to file. You can specify a file um, to to log the output, okay? So that way you can re-examine the output file. Okay, I'm just, I'm, I'll just go ahead and specify one so you know what it looks like. So I'll go to the temp folder and we'll specify a file, okay? Output.log is the output, because I want to show you what it looks like. It's really, really simple, the output. You know, you can use a text, any text editor to take a look at it. So right now, it is enabled, it has a header line, 
so I can close the window. So I'm going to do something that is completely, you know, not going to work, okay? So I'll just go ahead and go to the clock line, click it a few times, yeah. And it will go to um, PC enable, click it a few times, click this a few times, uh, turn it off, go to the RAM, you know, interface, click this a few times, like that. Um, okay, so I'm just going to say, I wonder whether that is going to do the trick. What do you think? No, okay. But it will suffice you know, to demonstrate what I want to demonstrate. Because now you can go back to the log window, go to the table, and it shows you what has been done previously. So the ordering of this doesn't seem to, is that in the right order? You know, was it the, the order of inserting into the into the table? I, I think so, I think. I think it's kind of random. Yeah. It's kind of random, but everything is here, okay? In other words, it kept track of you know, the state of all the components that we have selected. Now, this can be very helpful because when you're doing this and you say, oh, this, this is getting it done, okay? I think I have solved the puzzle, and then you have no recollection of what you just clicked, guess what? This will be helpful. This gives track of what you have just clicked, what you have just done you know, to specify the pins. Okay, let's say, you know, um, Logisim crashed before you got a chance to look at this. What are you going to do? Go to the log file. Okay, so we'll go to the, the regular text window here and take a look at the log file. So we go to temp, take a look at output.log, and it has exactly the same content. So this is how you can basically debug um, for this particular homework assignment. Okay, you're trying to figure out in what sequence do you want to specify the zeros and ones in the clock, the enable pins, the selection pins, and stuff like that, so that you can read consecutive locations from RAM into the program counter. Does everybody understand what this, is, this homework assignment is about? Yes? No? Yep. So we don't have to do a reset, right? We're just implementing. You, okay, you, you, okay. That's a good question. Let me show you the other portion of this homework assignment. Okay, so the other portion of this homework assignment is this particular spreadsheet. So I want you to right click and then save the file because you're gonna have to change it. So now that I have saved the file, oh, that won't work. Okay, I actually have to click it first, open in a new tab, and then it wants to open it. Okay, so I want to save the file first because, um, and you also need LibreOffice to open the file, okay? If you do not have LibreOffice, what do you do? Download it. Download it and install it. But I don't have money to buy software. What do you do? Free. Download it and install it because it's open source. It's free, okay? So there's no excuse not to do it unless you're running out of hard drive space. But it doesn't take much, okay? It doesn't really, you know, use up a lot of hard drive space. So you save the file. And then you can go ahead and open it. So I'll open microcode.ods. And by the way, you know, this is much improved over what I did last year because over you know, last year I did not have this planning sheet available. Now we do. All right, so when you look at this sheet here, let me just magnify so that we see the columns that we need to see, okay? So all of the signals that you need to deal with, they are already listed here. So your job, Okay, is to specify alternating zeros and ones in the clock line. That one has to be alternating zeros and ones. Okay, but on each row, you can now specify either a zero or a one for a binary signal, or an X or question mark to say it doesn't really matter. Okay, because some of these signals does not matter at all. You can specify any value from zero to seven, it would not impact what we are doing with this particular design. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so what you want to do is to finish one row at a time and say, okay, I want the clock to be, when the clock is zero, I want this signal to be a one, I want that one to be a four, okay? Some of these are not binary. The selection lines, some are binary, like for RAM, this is binary. It's either a zero or a one. For the program counter, this is a one or a zero because we can either select 
the, no, I take it back. This is, a, this, is, no, this is still a binary because there are only two inputs feeding into the program counter, you know, from the counter itself or coming from um, another line. And then, okay, I think I know one design flaw already. I'll describe it later, but at this point, you know, I'm not going to change it for your homework assignment. It will be changed next time. Um, this select is different, okay? This is all dealing with the register bank. This is for the input into the register bank. And because we have eight registers, this select is going to be how many bits wide? Three bits wide, okay? Because we have to be able to select one of out of three, uh, out, one out of eight registers. Same thing for the output, one out of eight, one out of eight. And then the ALU also has three bits because I think I specify a eight input multiplexer. So this also is three bit wide, which means it is a number from zero to seven. Okay, are there any questions about how to use this plan, uh, planning template? So the first thing you know for sure you will have to do is to put zeros and ones here. So how many zeros and ones do you need? That depends on what we're trying to do. So if you might be able to do it in three cycles, okay? This is three cycles right here. You might be able to do it in two cycles. You might be able to do it in four cycles, okay? So the number of cycles is not specified. But what you want to accomplish is to uh, go to the program count, use the program counter as a pointer. Go to that location, retrieve the content at that location and store it into the register and then increment the program counter. For those of you who have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, but you think you're familiar with C and C++, this is the equivalent code in C++. So let me use mouse pad. Okay, so I want the instruction register to store this. That's basically what we want. PC is a pointer. Okay, so I want to do a post increment on PC so that I'm using the current location of the program counter, but I want to dereference it, okay, because I want to use it as a, as a pointer. So whatever is stored at the location pointed to by the program counter prior to the increment, whatever is at that location, I want to store that into the inst instruction register. I know some of you are thinking, Tech, you should have said this earlier because it's so concise, it just captures what exactly what needs to be done. Nope. <laughs> All right, so does everybody know what you're supposed to do? Okay, so you have to specify the roles because you know, that's how we are going to do the music box eventually, okay? But we want to address each and every single little component first. So at this time, I'm going to point out the design flaw. There's no need to fix it at this point. I will fix it later, okay? So let me show you what the design flaw is. The design flaw is there's no way for me to uh, reset the program counter without resetting everything. So the proper way to do it, you know, this is what I'm going to do here, but I will re-upload the file, okay? So don't, you don't have to mess around with this for the homework assignment. What I need to do is to get rid of this line here because I want the program counter to be changeable using a, an explicit pin so that you, so we can reload the program counter with zero, okay? There are several ways to do it. You know, this is just one way to do it. The other way to do it is to have the have zero as one of the input into the multiplexer before the program counter. So that way we can use this selection pin to specify the zero and then use it to uh, clear the content of the program counter. But don't worry about this part just yet. You know, I'll deal with it, okay? So the next homework assignment, I'll give you an updated design, okay? But the spreadsheet will be for the most part the same as what we have here because I want to be able to, re I want to be able to reuse what we have today. Any questions? What about an example? Yeah, go ahead. So the purpose of the spreadsheet is just basically a, a more readable log of what's going on. Right. It's just a way for you to plan out everything because it, it does show all the signals that you have to deal with. So you have to look at each one and say, do I need to specify anything here? Does it matter? Okay. If it doesn't matter, you put a question mark or an X. If it does matter, you have to specify a zero or a one. 
So you don't want to use put at X when it does matter, okay? Because there are certain times you have to say this has to shut off, this has to shut off because multiple things can talk to the same bus. Then you have to specify and say, okay, everybody has to shut, you know, shut up. This is the only component that can specify that signal. Okay. All right, so I'll give you an example, okay? As an example, let me see what I'm going to do here. Okay, I know. So what I'll do is I'm going to say, I want to perform a calculation and store the result back into a register. Okay, this is something that we have done before, but not in the context of you know, everything connected like this. Okay, so I'm going to specify the operation and I'll just write it down using mouse pad, so this way we have a document of what I'm about to do. So I want, um, I want register A, which is the first register in the register bank of eight, to be um, register A plus register B. So I want to add the values of register A and register B, assuming they are already loaded with something, um, and store the result back into register A. What? How do I do this? Okay. Is that okay? Does everybody kind of understand what I'm, what I want to do? Okay. So let's go ahead and do this. <clears throat> So keeping in mind, you know, it's register A and register B, okay? When you look at the design, you know, it doesn't, it's not gonna be able to show you, you know, what we, what we can do with this. So what you wanna do is to specify some non-zero values into register A and register B first, so that we can actually check whether it's doing what it's supposed to. So by switching into the simulation mode, we just right click and say view register bank. And inside the register bank, we wanna change uh, register A, which is the first one, to a particular value. So 0, 05 is going to be fine with this one, and we'll specify 0, 07 for this one. So we want to compute the sum of 5 and 7, which is going to be C in this case because it is in hexadecimal. So I want to store 0, C back into register A, which is the top one. Okay? So this is the inside content of the register bank, but now I have to zoom back out into the main design so I can actually you know, specify the signals, okay? So I want to turn, I want to go to the login screen again, because you know, these are no longer the pins that I'm interested in, so I want to take these out, except for the clock line, but the other ones are not, uh, apparently I cannot remove, I cannot select multiple when I'm removing. That's kind of lame. Can you just draw a box? Huh? Nope. Okay, fine. So we have the clock line left, and then we have the ALU, obviously. So the ALU has to be selected. ALU selection has to be selected. Uh, we have the register bank stuff. So we have register zero output enable, uh, output select, output enable, output select. This is a misnomer. Unfortunately, I forgot to change the name of one of the pins. One of these is actually the input selection, but I mislabeled it here. Obviously, obviously the result of copy and paste. And I'll add all, all of these to the log screen here, so this way I can keep track of all of those things. And make sure I'm still logging into the file. It is enabled, okay, pretty good. Close the window, okay. Now I'm ready to do my experiment. So the first thing we have to do is to specify the input into the ALU and also to specify what operations we're going to do with the ALU. All right, well, we have to go into the ALU to find out, okay, you know, which one, what, where is the adder? Is it the first operation or the second operation? Which one is it? So we go to, let's see, we're in simulation mode. Then we go into the ALU, we go to, Oh, right. Good. There we go. Show view ALU. So you can see in the design that the AL, the adder is the first one. So we want this multiplexer to be zero, zero, zero to select the adder. Then I go back to the main design and say, okay, I want um, ALU selection to be zero, 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 which is already here. Um, then I want to specify 
the outputs. Okay, so output uh, zero is supposed to be register A zero 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 is right. This one has to be one, okay, because I want register B to be the other output, and then I want to enable the registers as outputs. So I want to enable this, enable this. Okay, so at this time we should have um, zero. 5 coming out of this line here and we should have 0, 07 coming out of this one here. You can click on the line it will show you. So this is great, okay? Because it's showing you that we do have 5, you know, as a binary pattern is 0, 1, 0, 1 coming out of register 0 output and then we have 7 coming out of this one. Okay? Which is great. Okay? So this this means I have specified the correct registers in the register bank to the output ports of the register bank. Are we still doing okay so far with this step? Then I want to check the output of the ALU, but I can't really see that. But from inside the ALU, I can I can see that at this point. So inside the ALU, I can, oh, okay, well the output enable is not turned on, so that's why we are not seeing anything. But at least we can click on this line and see whether we got 12, okay? Zero 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 one one zero zero is twelve. So the adder is giving 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 us the correct output, but the ALU does not have the output enable enabled. So that's why we're not seeing it through the port. Okay. Well, that's okay. That's easy to fix because we can go back to the main design and now we say, okay, uh, ALU, you can now present the result of the selected operation to the output. Okay. We put a one here. So at this point, the output of the ALU should be 1100. Now, how do you know which pin is which pin? I think some of you have already observed that. If you just hover the point, I mean your mouse pointer, over a particular port, it will show you what it is. Okay. So I took out all the actual text description because it's making the design very busy, more busy than it should be. And instead, I just leave it so that you can just hover over a pin or hover over a port to find out what it is. All right, so now we want to check this output here because this is supposed this is supposed to be the ALU output, and we click on it, and it also has one one zero zero, which is the sum of the two registers. Great. Okay, and then what do we do? We track down where this line is going, and it's going into the register input port. Okay, this is the data port of. Uh, overwriting a register. We are already specifying, this is the mislabel one. This is supposed to be register input selection, not register one output selection. So this is supposed to be selecting which register is going to be overwritten. It's already specifying the right register to overwrite, okay? Because we want to overwrite register zero, um, excuse, excuse me, register A with the result of the addition. So what is left to do? Well, what is left to do is we have to turn on the input enable, okay, to basically say, okay, you know, um, register A, I am selecting you, I want you to update, but at the following click, uh, f following transition of the clock, because I haven't done a single thing with the clock yet, right? This is all having zero as the clock. So I get into the design because I don't want to make any assumptions. So I'm going to go into the design, right click on the design here, view register bank, and just double check and make sure that everything is ready, that register 1 is getting ready to be selected. And, it, well, I'm sorry I got it wrong because <laughs> this register 0 is going all the way down here. So what I did was not, it's not going to work. But how come we got the zero and the seven, the five and the seven out? Okay, let me let me just double check on this one because it doesn't seem right to me. I see why. Yeah, because I flipped the input, but I did not flip the output. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is this is a you know this is a. My mistake, okay, but we can still fix it because we just have to flip the bits, you know, of the input register because we want to overwrite this guy and this guy should be the last one. So one, one, one should be the selection. So we go back to the main design and go like, yeah, well, 
we can always fix that. <laughs> so now we, if we go back into the design, yep. Um, do you have to do you have to um, disable the output before enabling the input, or can they be both enabled at the same? That's time? a good question. Okay, the the question is: Should we up, should we disable the output before we enable the input? If you disable the output, then the ALU input has nothing to specify anymore. And then the ALU would just be, the input to the ALU would, would then be floating, which is not a good sign. But what if you draw from the, the same? Well, let's, let's take a look what's, at what's going to happen, because I know what your question is. Yeah. Your question is, the moment we change the register, it will also automatically change the output of that register. which goes back into the ALU and the ALU would do its thing and then go back and change the input into that register in the end, right? That's, that's basically your question. Yes. We are saved because the register will only update on the rising edge. Okay, so nothing is gonna update unless we have a rising edge, but when it does update, it will only update on that one edge. So it will only update once, even though the input will change later, that's after the rising edge and it won't affect the content of the register anymore. So that's a very good question, but you know, it's not an issue in this case, okay? All right, so now we have selected this register and you know, we do have the right content specified here. The only thing that is not done is uh, the clock is not triggering, okay? It is going to trigger on a rising edge, which means the moment the clock line goes from zero to one, that register will change, okay? So now we go back to the main design, and we say, let's clock it, okay? So go, go from zero to one, and then back to zero, okay? Well, unless you have something to do at this time, okay? But what we'll do is we'll check out, you know, what is inside the register bank, right click, go to view register bank, and this one is updated to C, Right, which is correct. Um, all the other ones are not you know, updated. So we go back to the main design and then we look at the output out of the ALU. It is changed to, um, that's, uh, let's see, 16 plus three, which is 19, which is correct because it's computing um, 12 plus seven, okay, which is okay. And it's still going into the input of the register bank. Register bank is still selecting register zero, register A as the register to overwrite. How come it's not getting overwritten? Because the clock has already triggered. It's now at a high state, and it's not paying attention. Even though the register is paying attention, but because the clock is no longer triggering, it's just not, uh, it's not taking the input and update its content anymore. In other words, we are, we are listening for that click. We're listening for that snap to do the update. After the snap, I can change whatever is on the whiteboard. You're not gonna write it down. Is that okay? So this is why it is important for rising edge, falling edge, or for certain mechanisms to only be edge triggered so that you, know, you can do something like this. Now at this time, you know, I can clean up the whole thing. So when clock is going back to zero, I'll go ahead and clean up everything, okay? Turn off all the registers so that no one is paying attention or driving any bus. Turn off the output enable of the ALU, so now the design is all is back to a what we call a safe state, which means you know, there will be no potential of any bus fight at this point. Nobody is driving any component unnecessarily. It's all back to kind of like, quote unquote, a normal state. Yep. Um. What will happen if if uh, two components will drive a data bus at the same time? You will see a bus fight, okay? You know, let me show you what it looks like, okay? It's not difficult to have a bus fight in this case um, because to end up with a bus fight, you just have to find the data bus because the data bus can be driven by multiple components. In simulation mode, if you click on the data bus, which I think is this one, okay? You can see it can be driven by the register bank. It can also be driven by the uh, address register. Well, no, nope, I take it back. It can also be driven by, where is it it's coming from? There should be two components that can drive it. Oh, by the RAM, okay? So there are two components that can drive the, uh, the data bus. So I'm gonna uh, artificially create a scenario, okay? So I want register zero output enabled to be driving the address bus. So now the address bus is driven, OK? 
okay, is you can see the values. So instead of seeing xxxx, xxxx, which means it's not driven by anyone, it is now driven by the output out of the register bank. So the other thing I want to do is to make the RAM module to also drive it, so we can see what a bus pipe would look like, okay, because you, you can actually see it. So we go to the RAM module over here, and then we say, okay, how can I make the RAM module uh, drive the data bus? Well, first of all, the selection pin has to be enabled. Okay, so, so I tell the RAM chip and say, I'm talking to you. The clock line is not important. We are not writing anything. This is the load line, okay? Um, if you hover over it, it will describe what it does. Uh, load if one, if one load memory to output, okay? And right now it's a zero because it's dark green. And that's why the RAM module is now thinking that the processor will specify content in order to overwrite a location in memory. So there's no bus fight yet. If I turn that pin into a one, then we'll have a bus fight. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll go ahead and specify a one for the load signal, and we should have a bus fight at this point. But this, no, nope, it's not there. Component enabling still. Sorry. Um, well, the data line should be driven by the. And we don't have the same values here. Because there's no address selected? Uh, well, there's always something. Oh, I see. Thank you. The address line is, this is actually not, you know, this is not simulating actual right. hardware. Because if it's actual hardware, there's always some voltage, OK? It can be 0 volts, can be 0.25 volts, can be 1 volt, can be 2 volts. There's always some kind of voltage on a particular line. So it's always interpreting the, that voltage as a zero or one. And as a result, there's no such thing as you know, all the x's you know, to the address bus, because it, there's always an input. But in this case, you're right. Okay, That did not work out because of that. So if I specify you know, uh, the content to come out of at the address register, which will need a one, a two, excuse me, or one zero into here, then we end up with a bus fight. So you can see with the bus fight, it is all red because it says, you know, well, we don't know. You know the bit positions that are E's basically are the differences. Okay, so when you look at this, we have bit 0, 1, 2, 3, and bit 5 having E's. So it means, you know, with those particular bits, one thing is driving in one way, the other thing is driving in the other way. The zeros, on the other hand, are basically saying, both components are driving bits four, six, and seven to low. So it's not a fight. Are we okay so far with the, how to interpret um, the output of these wires? So you definitely don't want to end up with a red line because a red line means you, know, you have a bus fight. Um, with the homework assignment, I don't think it's really possible to end up with a bus fight. But with you know, other homework assignments that we'll be doing later, then you can definitely end up with a bus fight if you're not careful. Any other questions? No other questions? Yep, go ahead. So for the homework, mm -hmm. you had the log that had more components than you said were used or were going to use in the homework? Right, so <coughs> with the homework assignment, okay, let, let's say I'm doing this as, a, as my homework assignment, you know, which is just adding two registers and put it back into the other register. So obviously at this point, you know, whether um, what, what, what I specify into the PC does not really matter. Yeah. So what I want to do is to say PC in select to be an X. Huh. To basically say, we don't need to know what it is because you know, whether it's a zero or one, you know, it doesn't really change anything. On the other hand, we do want to make sure PC enable to be a zero because we don't want the program counter to update on the clock rising edge. So that's how you want to specify because you, you specify what matters to be a zero or a one or the actual value. And then what does not matter, you can just say put an X there and say, you know, it doesn't really matter. Okay, mm -hmm. any other questions? Well, let's go back and look at the log file and see what we can do with the log file because you're not going to turn in the log file. That's not what I want. I want your submission to be the spreadsheet. So if I go to take a look at the log file, which is now changed. 
Yep. Okay, so you can see that it has changed. You know, this is the, the second portion of the log. And it's too long, so it kind of wrapped around, I think. Yeah, the, the caption locked around, uh, wrapped around, but not the actual, you know, signals. So the clock line is this one. ALU output enable is this one, and so on. Um, so what we want to do is to basically look at, you know, everything here, because all of these things happen when the clock line is a zero. So they can all happen at the same time. So we, we look at this and we say, okay, what is the final state of the clock line being low? So we have output, ALU output enable being the one. We have, I think this one is a register. Okay, this is, the, this is the ALU selection, it's zero, zero, zero. This one is register zero output enable. Okay, so we have the output, we have to enable the output of the register bank. This is the selection of register zero output. This is a register output enable of the other output port. This is the selection for the other output port. This is the input port because I flipped the multiplexer, okay? And this one is the last one, and the last one is register input enable. So the last row is the only row that, it, that is important because everything that happens from let me turn on the line numbers so we can see, so I can refer to the line numbers. So everything from line 24 to 32, those are all basically, you know, steps within the time when the clock line is low. So you can capture all of those in one single shot. So to turn in, quote unquote, this homework assignment, I really only have line 32 as one. Um, I have line 30 three as one because I have to toggle the clock to actually update the register and then we have to go to uh, 34 again to basically reset everything. Yep. Do you reset everything on the clock one or clock zero? Or it doesn't matter? Okay, so the question, that's a good question. Most components, if not all, you know, they have by default the rising edge is going to clock in the data into the RAM, into the registers, and so on. So setting up everything when the clock is low is really important, okay? When the clock is high, you can change certain things, but probably not something that would affect the component that is gonna clock the data in, because then you'll be, you have, you, you end up with a raise condition. A raise condition is basically, you know, you have two pieces of hardware, okay? So they go through different you know, silicon paths. And the end result depends on who gets updated by the time this gets there, okay? So you don't want to have a raised condition, which means when, the, when you specify a one on the clock line, the only things you can change would be things that do not affect the input into things that are actually clocking something in, okay? So you just clock one zero and then and zero just reset everything? Correct. Now, to reset everything back to zero may not be necessary. In other words, you know, line 34 may not be necessary because the next thing that I want to do with this design may be something else. So I can leave it up to the other um, sequence to reset stuff you know, as needed. Oh, okay. So for this particular homework assignment, just capturing line 32 and line 33 and put those into the spreadsheet and identify which ones you know, should be X's is already sufficient. So, just to clarify, you want you want a log of no, I do not want no, a log. No, no. What I'm saying is, line like you said, line 32 and 33 is specifying the the change in state. Line 32 and line 33, correct? That's These what you two want is the change in state. Right. Yep. Exactly. So to do the home to finish this homework assignment, I'm gonna bring up the the spreadsheet itself, not this one. This one here. So I'm gonna bring up this spreadsheet. Um, when the clock is zero, I'll first go ahead and specify everything that I know for sure I have to set, okay? So I know on line 32 that we have a one on register, uh, ALU output enable, okay? So for the most part, I don't really need to look at the log because I already know what needs to be done. So this needs to be a one here, okay? This needs to be a zero. Now, I know it started off with a value of zero to begin with, but you still have to specify a zero. 
because it could have a leftover of some other values from before, so it does need to be specified. Um, in terms of the register bank, I want register input enable to be a one, selection to be a zero because we are overwriting register A. We want output to be enable here. This one is also a zero because one of the, the first output is also register A. This one is going to be a one and this one's going to be a one. But remember, with the selection of the register bank, okay, we are selecting one out of eight registers. So the value can go from zero to seven. I could not get um, the spreadsheet to recognize or to use binary numbers, so you have to use uh, decimal numbers. Okay. Um, address register, you know, is not important. Okay, so I'll leave out you know the ones that I don't think are important at this point. Okay. All right. So we have instruction register. Should it be enabled? Probably not. Okay. So you can specify. You can either specify not care, don't care, or put a zero here. Uh, we are not dealing with RAM, okay, so we can turn off you know, RAM, turn it off, because these can all potentially mess up you know, the, uh, the input or can end up with a bus fight. The address register, you know, put a zero here, program counter, um, there's no need to enable the program counter, it should not be updating here. The input select is the one that's going to be an X because you know if I disable the program counter so it cannot possibly be updated, how you specify the multiplexer before that becomes irrelevant. Okay. The address register, we also wanted to specify a zero because we don't want to accidentally change the address register. So this will be the first row. The second row is going to be pretty much a copy of the first one except for one control signal. The only control signal that's going to be no, actually, I take it back. Everything is just the way it is. The only one that's different is the clock itself because we want to maintain the output of the ALU while we update the input register of the register bank. Yep. Can you pull up your, uh, your the log, your the log. design? Yeah. And uh, put that up, up, up higher. Yeah. Thank you. So that's how I would do, you know, my little imaginary homework assignment. What am I you know, preparing you guys to do? How does this relate to something that you might end up doing at Intel, AMD, or ARM, or some other processor design company? What are we getting ready for? Program, Program the microcode of your processor. Okay, so the music box is not here yet, but this is going to be the content of the music box. Okay, so the music box will have the, all of these you know, little snippets, okay, little sequences of you know, zeros and ones. Okay, and eventually, okay, so I can tell you this is a preview of what you'll be doing. And I know how many of you are looking forward to it. It's like, come on, let me do it now. Okay, so the preview is most of those pins, okay? Eventually, once we are done with the microcode engine, all the pins except for reset and clock will be gone. Because all of those pins will now be driven by the microcode engine. So right now we have all of these pins kind of floating around and you have to manually do everything because we don't have the conductor of the orchestra. Okay, we don't have an automated uh, conductor. So you are the conductor right now. You have to say, oh, register bank, specify that as the input register. Register bank, specify that as output one, specify that as output zero. ALU, specify that as the operation and output enable. Okay, clock, clock. Okay, then you specify something else. So you have to do all of this stuff because nobody else is doing it. But eventually, we're gonna automate this, okay? We're gonna quote unquote script the whole thing. Except that quote unquote script is part of the microcode engine and you'll be basically working with the microcode engine to get this to work. Are there any questions about you know, how this connects to the design of a processor you know, related to computer architecture? This is all the stuff that's going on inside the processor itself. Yep. 
Oh, that's a that's a new way to take roll. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you how we are gonna take roll this time. Okay, so you have to go to the lab <laughs> and do this in the lab. So I want you guys to go to the lab and sign in. You can do this, you can do it on your phone too. You know, that it will register. So what you need to do is to go to just go to Moodle right now, okay? Um, and it will register you as you know being present. Question. So if I'm on Moodle right now, it just knows that. Yeah, I think so. Let me let me just check. So if I go to attendance. Yep. So four people have signed in already, and um, when I when I review this, I can actually see the IP address. So if someone is using, are you guys using 4G or Wi-Fi? Using 4G. 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 Using 4G. Okay. If you're using 4G, I'll well, I'll, I'll fix this later. It's not a big deal. Okay. People who are people who are not here are unlikely to sign in Yehudo right now at this point, right? Okay. So for those of you who have a cell phone or a mobile device that can sign in right now, just sign into Moodle, go into this class, okay? Because that would just you know, register you as present. If you do not have a mobile device, you can go to the lab, okay? You'll go to the lab as long as you do it before noon time, it's gonna be okay. But next time, I'm gonna give you guys a password, a little passcode, so you will have to enter passcode to uh, to rent to to be present in the class. So this kind of beats you know passing a piece of paper around a little bit, okay. <clears throat> and if you haven't noticed, you know Moodle is actually very mobile friendly. I mean the uh, it actually has a it doesn't show you the same interface when you're using a small device. It actually gives you a more mobile friendly interface. Is it? I'm not sure whether I should bring this up, but I think I'm going to bring it up anyway. Okay, <laughs> And it's getting recorded. I don't even care about that. <laughs> OK, how many of you are ready to, for a new LMS? Not Moodle. Okay, Moodle is going to be around for a little bit. OK, um, there are people who want to switch from D2L to Canvas. Has anyone heard of Canvas or the OEI? OK, you have heard of I Canvas. Know several states use Okay. Have you used it? I have. Okay. I've so, heard all right. So this is actually coming soon in your future. Uh, if you plan to be here by year 2017, it might impact you. If you think you'll be done by 2017, it's not going to impact you. Okay. But they are planning. Okay. There are people who are suggesting that we should switch to Canvas uh, from D2L. I think with this class, I can safely say that most people will be done here by year 2017 fall, okay? But who knows, you know, sometimes you know, people just want to hang around and maybe change major, do something else, okay? You know, that might impact you. All right, back to floating point numbers, okay? So I can give you a preview of what we are going in, which direction we are going in terms of floating point numbers. So let me just go to the floating point numbers stuff. Up, 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 up somewhere. Okay. Non integer representation, that's where it is. <clears throat> so, a typical homework assignment is to uh, is for you to write a program to convert a value into a floating point value. Okay, into the bit patterns of a floating point number. Because I want you to go through the trouble to, uh, to go through the same process that your computer has to go through to find out what is the binary representation of a floating point number. Okay? So what I'll do is I'm going to give you a rundown of you know, how to do it manually first, and then you can start to think about how to do it you know, with a program. Okay? So let's go ahead and start with a particular value that can be represented as a binary number easily. I don't want to give, I don't want to give you guys something that's really hard to do. Okay? There are values that are hard to do, okay? Values that are equivalent to 1 over 3 in base 10 because what do you get as a, as a decimal number? It's 0.333 because it's recurring, right? So if you have a recurring binary pattern and you have like 60 something bits, you know, it does get tedious. I don't want to give you guys something like that. 
So whatever we want to do, we want it to be a number that can be easily represented as a binary floating point number. Okay? As a binary floating point number, what we really want is to have some sort of integer times a certain power of 2. It can be a big power of 2, it can be a really small power of 2, but as long as it is you know, 2 to the power of something here, any, if you can put an integer here and put an integer here, the resulting value can be easily represented. Okay, so we'll go ahead and pick one. So let's go pick, I don't know, 5 over 64. Okay? So I want to store the value, so let me just go ahead and put it into the mouse pad. Come on, where's my mouse pad? There we go. Okay, so we want to store 5 divided by 64 or 5 64th as a value in floating point number. In double precision floating point representation. Okay, there we go. All right. So the first thing we want to do is to look at this number and go, okay, how do I coerce this into a one point blah, 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 times two to the power of blah, blah, blah notation? Because that's the first thing you have to do. Is you have to normalize the number into that format. Okay, so we'll take a look at this number first. So 5 times 1 divided by 64, because I want to separate the quantity from the 2 power of 2. Okay? So I want to do everything in binary now. So uh, 5 is easy. 1, 0, 1 in base 2 is 5, times 2 to the power of, uh, uh, this is negative what? 64 is 2 to the power of 6. So 1 over 64 is going to be 2 to the power of negative 6. How do you write that? How many zeros? I know it is a point something, but how many zeros are we dealing with? OK, point 1 is 2 to the power of negative 1. I want 2 to the power of negative 6. How many zeros do we need? Five. Five zeros, because it's the sixth place after the, des the binary point. Okay, there we go. And this is all in base 2. Okay, 1 over 1 is in base 2. Point zero 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 one is also in base 2. Okay, well, when, if this is in base 2 already, there's an actual implicit point here, right? You can always add a point to the right-hand side of the least significant digit as a whole number, right? Because it's always there. So if I want to shift this point to the left by one place, what do I do? We end up with 10.1 one one times what? I have to adjust the exponent, right? I have to adjust, not the exponent, but the uh, power of 2 accordingly. So how do I adjust the power of 2 when I'm having the mantissa? What do I need to do with the power of 2? I need to double it. If I have one, I have to double the other, right? So now I will end up with that. Is that making any sense? Because I want to preserve the same value. I'm just expressing the same value differently. Because eventually I want the mantissa to look like one point blah blah, and then, then we specify a power of two as the exponent. So that's what we do, but we are not in place yet, right? You know, because we, we want one point something, this is one zero point something. So we want to do it one more time. We want to shift it one more time, so now it is 1.01 times 0.0001. There we go. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So out of this, we can now pretty much you know, specify all the components already. So we want to specify what is the mantissa. Mantissa is 1.01 1 .01 in base 2. The exponent in base 2 is, let's see, negative 4, because it's 4 places to the right-hand side of the binary point. The sign is a 0, because it is a non-negative number. Okay? All right. But then you have to remember, we are not going to store the mantissa. We are storing the fraction part of the mantissa. That 1 to the left-hand side of the point is always there. It is implicit. So that means, you know, the fraction part is going to be 0, 1, and then a whole bunch of zeros, okay? What about the exponent? 
we do not store negative 4 as a sign number like in uh, using 2's complement. Instead, everything is offset by 1023. Do you guys remember that? So 1023 minus 4 is 1019. Okay. So we want the exponent, exponent offset exponent because we are now taking into consideration that we have to add uh, 1023 to the actual exponent. This is 1019. Uh, the sign is still zero. Okay. All right. I think we are quite ready to translate this into the actual number. So we'll now you know, express this as the actual number. Um, the sign is going to be zero. Sign is zero. That's the most significant bit out of the 64-bit pattern. The next one is going to be exponent, which is 10, 11 bit wide. Okay, so we want to specify 1019 as an 11 bit number. And of course, I'm a little bit too lazy to do that. Okay, 1019. Okay, so we'll start with a 512. And we'll say if this is greater than or equal to that. Specify a one, otherwise specify a zero, and then we say this is this number minus that number. And this number is whatever is left from the previous row. The rest we just copy. I know you guys can do this with your calculator, but as I tell people, if there's a harder way to do something, I don't do it. The harder way. Oh, okay, I forgot one thing. This number has to be this number divided by 2. And we'll do this again. We propagate. We should have 12 bits. Okay, that's not right. Oh, I forgot one thing. I forgot uh, it needs to do the multiplication to this thing. There we go. And then we need to repropagate this up and down. <laughs> up and down, like that. Okay. So what is the binary number that we are looking at? <laughs> this is the most significant bit, right? So it'd be one, 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 seven ones, zero, one, one, and should be it. Oh, I'm missing that one leading zero. That should be a leading zero here. So 10, 24. Okay, so, but there's a leading zero here. I forgot about the leading zero. So this is zero, one, seven, seven ones, and then three, and, and then the zero, and then the one, one. Okay, there we go. So go back to the mouse pad here. The fraction is zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then the zero, one, one. Check. Yep. All right. That's and the, sorry, that's the exponent, right? That's the oh, you're right. That's the exponent, which is the next eleven bits, and then the fraction is the rest, right? So we just have zero, one, zero, blah, 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 blah. Okay, fills up the rest. Okay, now we want to convert this into the hexadecimal representation because we want to be able to check whether this is right or not using GDB. So now we group the name, the thing as 0, 0, 1, 1. Okay, so the first one is the sign and then three bits coming from the exponent. And then we take another four bits out of the exponent, which is 1, 1, 1, 1. Oops. And then we have the 0, one, oh, we're missing one here. So there's a one, zero, one, one of the exponent. And then the rest would just be zero, one, zero, blah, 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 blah. They're all zeros at the end. Okay, let me just count a bit. So I think that's right. Yep, it is. Okay, so in hexadecimal, it becomes zero x three, because this is three in hexadecimal. And f, because that's an f. This is, um, this is 11, which is a b. And then we have a four, and then a whole bunch of zeros. Or if you prefer, we have we can shift it um, 
52 times, I think, because we have already accounted for 12 bits here. Nope, 16 bits. So 64 minus 16 is 48, so 48 bits. So we are shifting the whole thing 48 bits in order to end up with the bit pattern that we want. So now the question is, if I store this bit pattern into memory and choose to interpret that those eight bytes as a double precision floating point number, do we get you know, five divided by 64? That's the question. Okay, do you guys do remember how to do it? Okay, I am going to, hmm. We are running out of time. There's a next class into this classroom. I will continue this at the lab, okay? So let me save everything first, and then we'll, we'll take this to the lab and do it over there. And the test is Thursday, right? The test is Thursday? The, oh, we don't have a test schedule yet. Oh, I thought... Didn't, didn't you do a, a test review on Tuesday? I haven't had a chance to work on it. Nope, 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 we did not. Oh, I must be mixed up, sorry. This is a lot of test times going around. So. I know, you know, I normally would have a test, but since, you know, I'm still on the topic right now, so I'm okay. postponing the test a little bit. Do you have an estimate? Not yet. Okay, all right, just check it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you go check. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I thought the formula was minus 